Welcome to Filthy Casuals Review, a game where two bumbling magic morons try to match wits with the best brains Limited has to offer, and Marshall Sutcliffe. Just kidding, love you Marshall. Here's how it works. When a new magic set comes out, pro player Luis Scott Vargas and self-proclaimed food and beverage director Marshall Sutcliffe grade all of the commons and uncommons from the set on their excellent podcast, Limited Resources. Kenny and Seth have each done a blind review of the cards on their own. The goal? Get as close as possible to the grades the pros gave them. I'll let LSV explain the grading system. A's. These are your bombs, your game winners, uh, the just the best cards in the set. They tend to be really efficient, good in many situations, or just capable of ending a game by themselves. Bs. Bs are cards that actively pull you towards their colors. Uh, these are headliners for a set, go-to cards, and reasons to be in a particular color, clan, or guild. Cs. Cs are playable. Most cards fall into this category. They're fairly interchangeable, and you're going to end up with a bunch in your deck. Cs don't mean bad. Cs are just kind of your average card. Ds. Ds are sometimes playable, but you'd prefer not to run them. These are the cards that when you've got these in your deck, you kind of wince a little. You're, you're actively unhappy that you have to play them. Fs. And then Fs are uh, basically unplayable. Seth and Kenny will get points based on how far off they are from the professional grades. It's a lot like golf. There's a lot of cursing and the low score wins. To spice it up, the loser of our little game will have to buy a booster box of the new set for the winner. Stick around till the end of the show to see who won. But for now, let's talk about some of the truly awful decisions Kenny and Seth made, and maybe even some of the valuable lessons learned, as Filthy Casuals review... Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons. Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. A Magic the Gathering story. By Wizards of the Coast. Welcome, everyone. To Filthy Casuals Review, episode number four, I believe. Yes. Seth, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Let's get right into our rewards and awards for the last set, Strixhaven. Sounds great. Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, before we get into the new set, D&D Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, we want to talk about our last Filthy Casuals Review. And... We have a tradition of going back and looking how we did overall, particularly in the cards that we disagreed with limited resources. And I'll start with my own defeat card where I messed up on, and it should be no surprise to anyone. My defeat was a hill giant, novice dissector. This is three and a black for a three, three troll warlock. You pay one and sacrifice another creature, and you get a 1-1 counter on target creature. Activate as a sorcery. I'm very curious how this is going to pan out in this episode, because I was really talking a lot last time about trying to learn my lesson about sure. Hill Giants. And I heard from you some texts before we started recording that maybe there's some Hill Giant stuff going on. Yes, I did say a lot more Hill Giant esque <laughs> cards in this set here, and I might have fallen for a trap on this one. We'll see. Yeah. This one, I gave it a B minus. They gave it a C minus. Honestly, uh, it, it was not a great card. Limited mm -hmm. resources, eventually, the quote that I have here is I've never seen this card do anything good. Mm -hmm. And having played some Strixhaven, I agree. Fair. Moving on to Seth's defeat. Your defeat is Inkling Summoning. Okay. So this was the one black or white, black or white lesson that gives you a 2-1 white and black Inkling creature with flying. And at the time when we recorded the initial episode, you were very down on it for being a 3-mana 2-1 flyer. Mm -hmm. But the reality is the fact that you could pull this as a lesson means it's just a, a really cheap and easy card and you always have some more flying tokens that you can pull into the game so this actually wound up being a very strong lesson card overall makes sense i that, i think that goes back to my understanding of lessons and it kind of just goes back to mechanics in general just if you understand how a mechanic works in a given set and are for or against it and 
more appropriately, if you can guess what LSV's thinking is with this, right. uh, you'd be a lot better off with it. I went through all of I didn't think this was that great, um, and obviously resulted in my defeat card, but uh, yeah, I know it's, it's one of those things where I just did not judge that one properly, and I'll take my defeat on that card. But, very similarly, your Triumph card is also a lesson, strangely mm. enough, for environmental sciences. You gave a mm. B-minus to, they gave a C to, and what they wound up saying after a few weeks of playing in the format is that every deck wants this card. You want at least yes. one of these, and it's one of the least replaceable lesson effects. This okay. card is two generic mana for a sorcery lesson. You get a basic land, put it into your hand, and you gain two life. It looks very innocent just reading the card, like not that much going on. Sure. But it's, it's actually the card that makes everything tick, and every deck that can learn wants this lesson. Mm -hmm. Other than the Mythic Rare lesson, Mascot Exhibition, LSV says this is the best lesson. Sure. You want this Absolutely. one above anything else. And you called it above anybody else in this game. It's just generically good. And I think, you know, this, I think we're going to get into this again today. Uh, just a mm. small preview there. But I don't think that generically good cards are valued as high as they could be you know, in initial ranking so yeah i take my legs on there but i'll keep getting these triumphs uh this way so yeah i'll, you know, I'll take it that's a good call my okay. triumph is explosive welcome okay this is seven colorless and a yeah. red for an instant uh it deals five damage to any target three damage to another target and adds three red to your pool now when we were recording our show i gave it a b plus mm -hmm. Limited Resources gave it D or F. And in our show where we recorded, I said, I would bet that this will be the card that after two weeks of playing, the LR boys will be drooling all over it. Yeah, I remember lo, that. Lo and behold, two weeks later, their first foray into it, where they're talking about, here's what we're actually finding. They say, this thing is great. Um, LSV says, it just turns out that eight mana cards are something you can do in this format. And okay. I want to say, honestly, to brag on myself, a lot of the cards that I staked a claim on in our show turned out to be good. There we go. If you want to check it out, episode 595 on limited resources, they talk about how Cram Session is good. They talk about how Needlethorn Drake is good. Explosive Welcome. Like, I actually feel like I did pretty good overall calling sure. the cards that would be good. Which is also weird, because... I drafted a fair amount of this format, and I feel like I played pretty bad at it. Oh, interesting. I don't know why that is. But from an analytical standpoint, I think I did okay. Okay, very good. Lastly, the wild card. The card that nobody got right. But <laughs> I'll be honest, Seth, you got way closer than the rest of us. Okay. It is Biomathematician. This is one green and a blue for a 2-2 human wizard. It enters the battlefield and makes a 0, zero fractal that you put a 1-1 one, one counter on. So it's a 2-2 two, two creature that makes a 1-1 one, one fractal token. Okay. Now, I was drooling all over this card. They were drooling all over this card as like a way to make fractals. 3 mana 2-2 two, two plus a 1-1. One, one. You split up your resources. We're imagining you're pumping them up, getting like 5 of these commons in a deck, and you pump up all your fractals. What actually happened in the format is you just play this, it's just a 2-2 two, two, and a 1-1, one, one, and that's mm -hmm. not that exciting. Sure. So this wound up not being as good as we thought, but you were the closest. You gave this a C-. minus. You said this is barely playable, and it wound up this was just not a good card. Sure. There we go. All right. Let us move forward, though, into... The new set, D&D Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. We're going to start, as usual, with the gold cards... And I see you don't have a lot of cards that you have in mind that you want to talk about here. Nothing to talk about. I saw you wanted to talk about a few more cards, and I figured that I would uh, chime in on those as well. Yeah, uh, all these, sure. all these in general here. I mean, they're, I think I have all but one. Yeah, all but one of them as build around cards. And yes. They're all a B of some sort, uh, minus a couple that we're actually about to talk about. So um, mine are very similar. Um, I can say about the same thing for all of them, but it will be. 
good to hear your discussion on what uh, what you think of these cards as well. For sure. So the two that I want to talk about, the first is Berwin of Clan Undor. Um, and this was very early in my review. This is a four mana three three. Sure. With some abilities. So I was like, Sounds okay, familiar. here we go. The Hill Giant test. And last time we talked, I said, I want to look at Hill Giants and think, what would I put this at? Mm -hmm. And then sure. dock it a few points from there. Sure. So this is a two white black 3-3 three, three, legendary creature dwarf cleric when it comes into play venture into the dungeon so i guess we need to introduce this if you haven't listened to it we reviewed this a few episodes back but basically when you venture into the dungeon you begin this branching path through one of three dungeon cards you get incremental advantage and hopefully you complete it at the end and get some big reward Barrowin also has, when it attacks, you return up to one creature card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield if you've completed a dungeon. My thing about this card, it costs four mana, it's a 3-3. Three, three. We already know Hill Giants I, I have struggled with historically. Comes into play in Ventures, which I think we should save talking about Venture more in depth later on. That's fair. It's a pretty limited value. When it attacks, you get a creature that costs three or less into play if you've completed a dungeon. Mm -hmm. But my thing is, how good is a creature that costs three or less when you have a four mana three three attacking? It doesn't have good attacks. Right. Like you attack I with a four mana three three and it trades for three mana cards or two mana cards. Sure. I agree. And this is actually one of uh, two that I, instead of in the B category, I ranked as a C plus myself. We, I both, we both said C plus, yeah. We did. I still call this a build around because I think it did focus on finding venturing cards. I think this may be a little stronger, but again, just to your point, a C and C three or less to get it back once you completed the dungeon. I think there's a lot of setup and I think the payoff itself is kind it's of like, lackluster. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. I completed this dungeon. Um, now I have my four mana three, three that can get me a shitty creature on turn eight or whatever. Yeah. I just don't think that's great. No, that doesn't seem super good to me. So we mm -hmm. gave it a C plus, they give it a B plus. So we're yeah. a full grade off on that one. Full grade off there. Okay. The other card I wanted to talk about was Brunor Battlehammer. Okay. This is two red white for a 5-3 legendary dwarf warrior. Each creature you control gets plus two plus O oh for each equipment attached to it. And you can pay zero rather than the equip cost for the first equip ability that you activate each turn. Mm -hmm. I gave this a C plus. LR gave it a B, you gave it a B as well. And yeah. everybody said, obviously, it's a build around card. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is actually pretty good. Um, I think I messed up on this one uh, because equipment has sucked ass for <laughs> basically the last two or three years, at least. Sure. And every time I think equipment is good, it turns out not to be good. But there's actually a fair amount of equipment in this set and it's not bad. There's a couple really good common equipments. Um, in particular, plus two mace, a two mana, three to equip, plus two, plus two. This creature turns it into a plus four, plus two to equip that costs zero, which mm -hmm. is actually crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that is excellent. Were you looking at that when you graded this card? Or are you just like, I like the rate on this card? Well, it, it's a little bit of both. So we'll get into the plus two mace uh, here in just a little bit. But um, after looking at, so I took a, the exact opposite approach. You looked at these first. I actually looked at these last. Mm. Um, in retrospect, I probably should have looked at these first. Oh, the um, multicolors, you mean? The multicolors, yes. Yes. So after seeing all the equipments that were available, I really liked Bruno after that. Mm. So it was one of those things where, yeah, it had a stronger great uh, rating for me uh, after looking at all the cards but I could see where if you looked at this first I wouldn't rank this one as highly because of, of previous knowledge of how poor the uh, 
uh, artifacts and equipment. Spells are in magic in the past two, three, five years at this point. For sure. So I get what you're saying there. Now, we neither of us took note of plus two mace. Should we talk about it, though, since we're just discussing it? Sure. While, while we're at it here, yeah, we can definitely talk about that one. So plus two mace is one in a white. It's an artifact equipment common. Quick creature gets plus two, plus two. It's a quick three. And I hate that. Yep. I really do, because everything's two about it. It's two cumulative mana cost. I know. Two mace, plus two, plus two. It could cost three. Uh, it's very close to a, a very old card called Bullshock Morningstar, which mm-hmm. is uh, two, two, two colorless two, mana. Two. Yeah, plus two, plus two, equip two. It just kills me that. Um, yeah, this, this card is less of that. a two card than that one was. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. So I just just a little irksome, but yeah. I'll I'll let it slide. But uh, on this one in particular, um, kind of going back to what you were saying, you were. Looking multiple cards first. Plus two mace was actually my first card that I looked at. Mm-hmm. And going back to artifacts and equipments, not very good over the past few years, so I this one to do right now. Not thinking about the context of everything out here. If I were to review this all over again, I definitely wouldn't be grading it at the D or F category. I'd probably still rank it as probably a C at this point. Which is um, what I gave it to, yeah. It is, yeah. So you ranked it as a C, I gave it a B or an F, uh, LR gave this a C plus. So I would have been closer in line, but that just goes to show you like the order in which you actually look at these cards actually does matter. So it does, it is, yeah. It is important. I was thinking as well, um, if Volshock Morningstar were put into a modern magic set, it would be super strong. I think mm-hmm. everybody like the first set of basic equipment from Mirrodin were overtuned. Like, Bone Splitter is too good to put in a modern <laughs> limited. It is. Set. It and is. I, and Warning Star is the same way. Volshock Battle Gear is the same way. That's 3-3, three, three, plus 3, plus 3. Mm-hmm. Um, this one's very close to Volshock Morning Star, and I think that's why I gave it a little bit of a bump. 3 sure. to equip is a lot, but that's a lot of stats to be giving a creature. It is. That It really is. And I think another thing, too, is that Creatures of today are definitely not the creatures of the yesteryears. Years. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go yesteryears at this point. Um, so yeah, I, I think that uh, with how quick and how powerful creatures have become, um, yeah, something like a Bullshock Morningstar or any of the other um, equipment that you had mentioned mm-hmm. is just it'd be almost backbreaking at that point because everything would just go yeah. so so much quicker at that point. So. They've had to tune them, and I think they're trying to find the balance, and I think they're getting there. I think it's getting to where these are, the power levels of the equipments yeah. seem to fit pretty well in the, in the D&D set here. So I thought they did a good job there. Yep. One more thing for me, at least, and the multicolor. It's more just a name drop on this one here, so actually my fate, my highest grade in one was uh, Faraday uh, Devil's Chosen. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just going to call it now. I'm going to name her All Day Faraday. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> I would pick her every single time. All Day Faraday. Absolutely. Also a very good card. Do you want to read I it agree. real quick? I, I will read it. Faraday Devil's Chosen. Two blue and red. Legendary creature. Teakling Warlock. It's uncommon. 3-3. Three, three. And the text is Dark One's Own Luck. Whenever you roll one or more dice, Faraday Devil's Chosen gains flying and menace until end of turn. If any of those results was 10 or higher, draw a card. And in the blue and red categories, they're very much into rolling multiple yes. dice. Yep. So chances are really good that you're going to draw a card. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is you're just flipping a fantastic a coin to card. draw a card, basically. Absolutely. I think I think this is a great card to, to be playing with. So. Yep, we gave it build around B pluses. They gave it a build around B. It's I think the, I think they'll go higher card. on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's all I have for multicolor. All right, jumping down into white again. Uh, I'm going to talk about cleric class, and okay. this is one of my big overarching themes for my review of this set. There is a cycle of cards in each color. And there are rares even as well in multicolor for different D&D classes. These mm-hmm. are enchantments sure. that you can... They come into play with some inherent ability 
and then you can level them up and get additional abilities. I highly, highly underrated them as far as LR's grade. So for okay. Cleric class, I gave it a D or F. They gave it a B, and you gave it a B. Yes. And I think that theme will probably hold truth through the entire <laughs> okay. review. Okay. So Cleric class is one white mana. Its ability that it comes with is if you would gain life, you gain an additional life instead. To level it up, you have to pay an, an additional three and a white. Whenever you gain life, you put a 1-1 one, one counter on a creature you control. And then to get to level 3, it's an, an additional 4 and a white. When it becomes level 3, you get a creature card back from your graveyard to the battlefield, and you gain life equal to its toughness. So, let me say my overall thoughts here. Okay. And I'll probably bring them up more as we talk about this, but these classes are so mana intensive. So you, you, you play one white for an enchantment, and it just adds a little extra life to your pool. Not sure. That definitely would not be worth it. Then you have to pay another four. So at this point, and this is what I can't get over, at this point you have paid five mana into this card, and you have gotten nothing, basically. Now you need to be gaining life, and now you're going to be getting some advantage. It seems very, very slow to me. And I guess the question is, how slow is this format? Mm -hmm. How many turns do we expect an average game to go? So at this point, you've you've paid one white and then three and a white, and nothing has happened. Sure. So I, I think it's pretty nuts. I mean, Marshall is the biggest proponent of, well, I should say he is the biggest detractor of cards that you put mana into that don't inherently do anything by themselves. Mm, okay. Yeah. And and this seems like a prime example of a card that just doesn't do anything for a long, long time. But they consistently rate these cards as being pretty powerful. Did you when you looked at the classes, did you consistently say they were pretty good? I had to initially no, I didn't. Uh but I misunderstood what the classes did. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually had to read into those. I was under the initial impression that once you got to level two, you would lose level one, and then, you know, depending on what the card did. And so say you're at level two, you right. go level three, you lose the abilities of levels one and two. And we actually get all of them at the It side just at the adds time. those abilities. It does, so I thought that was powerful, and maybe that was me swinging uh, the pendulum a little too far. I right. kind of worked in my favor in this point here. Um, I didn't have this as a build around uh, versus LR who, who said this is a build around B. Um, in retrospect, yeah, this would definitely be a build around. So I missed on that part of it. But um, like, if you're not gaining life, this isn't very good. Exactly. Yeah, this would be. Yeah, this would definitely be wasted space in your deck if you don't have right. a dedicated life gain. So. Um, I probably swing a little too far on the pendulum. Again, like I said, it, it uh, worked in my favor this time, but um, overall, I do like the classes, and I really like how the, the mechanic works. Um, I think that definitely fits into the D&D theme. I think it's uh, very sure. cool. Um, but beyond that, yeah, it's a... Uh, yeah, this one here, it definitely has to be built around, or else it's just not going to work very yeah. well. And yeah, I understand your lower grade of this one in particular. Uh, be very curious to see what uh, these other classes will be bringing this year. I agree. Um, I wonder if these classes are going to feel a bit like the runes from Call Time. Like oh, they, yeah. They seem good and free, and there's a rotation of them for every color, but it just seems like just too much work for not enough payoff. But... I think in this set they might actually work because there are a lot of bad cards in this set. I'm going <laughs> to say right now, a lot of bad cards. I, I would agree with that. I felt I was being a little harsh on some of these <laughs> yeah. cards, and I actually bumped up the grades because I'm like, oh, I don't think there's going to be How that can many there be bad this many Ds and Fs? <laughs> yeah, so that's going to shoot me in the foot there by, <laughs> by being a little too nice, actually. <laughs> I, I eventually got very aggressive with, with my D's and F's, and oh, I'm you? glad I did. Because yeah, I was no, like, that's... these seem bad. How can there be this many bad cards, <laughs> though? Yeah, it seems like uh, 
the power is within a few cards, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, let's go to your next card in white. Which one do you okay. want to talk about? Let's talk about Monk of the Open Hand. Mm -hmm. And this one here, I actually really liked. Mm -hmm. um, I gave it a B-. Uh, you actually gave it a D or an F, so there's a big difference between us on this one. And, yes. Uh, LR was a little bit closer to you in giving it a C-. So let me read the card here. I'll kind of give my explanation as to, to why I gave this a negative. Uh, great on this one. So, Monk of the Open Hand is white mana. It's an uncommon. It is a 1 1 elf monk creature. And the text says, Flurry of Blows. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Monk of the Open Hand. This is recency bias for me. Uh, mm. I actually think this one would have fit much better in, uh, and it actually is a very close card to. Uh, the Lumamancer, I can't remember yes. the exact card on that one, but it's very similar to that one. And I gave that one a high grade as well, so I'm consistent at least. <laughs> but I think that, um, to, to your point you said earlier, I think this is a little bit slower set. And it's going to be harder to get those second uh, spells each yes. turn. I still think that this can be okay. I wouldn't give it the D or F per se, but I, I can definitely see the words like, C minus, just like filler. I wouldn't be actively going towards it in, in retrospect with it after seeing. Again, this is probably the I think fifteenth card that I looked at overall. So when I saw this, I'm like, "Ooh, that's a nice quick white spell that can get in for some damage, uh, can get pumped up." Yeah, and yeah. So I thought, yeah, that has some, some merit. So I, I gave it the B minus. Retrospect, I'd probably still go with like C C plus, honestly. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I was a little high on this one because I, this was early on. It's definitely stronger than Lumamancer, which was... I agree. Had, it's an 0-1 that when you play a instant or sorcery, it gets plus 2, plus 2. This is better than that, which is kind of yeah. weird. Like, this this card should have been what Lumamancer was in Lumamancer. I agree. Like, it would have been made more sense in Strixhaven. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, this particular card, I just look at it as a one mana one one that is completely whatever i don't see like you might put one extra counter on this card mm -hmm. over the course of a game and that just does not seem nearly good enough to me which is why i gave it the d or f that's very fair i, and, I totally understand that and lsv even said in their review uh this set doesn't have a double spell theme like, this is the only card that references casting more than one spell a turn. So, mm -hmm. I mean, what are you doing playing this card? Like, white-blue is like the venture mechanic deck, so... Yeah, yeah. It just exactly. doesn't quite fit. Yeah, there, so that actually touched on a really good subject. I actually mentioned this in a card uh, in green that we'll be talking about here later, but I think there's a lot of cards that have kind of identity crises. Yes. <laughs> Within definitely. its own colors or even the card itself. Um, and th this is a good example here where it's doesn't really fit anywhere. Yeah. So it's it's interesting for sure. Yeah. I want to talk about Potion of Healing. Okay. This is one and a white for an artifact. When it enters the battlefield, draw a card, pay okay. a white and sacrifice it. You gain three life. Okay. So, I gave this a D or an F. You gave it a C. They gave it a built around C minus. Mm. In my mind, we just had as a uh, bonus mystical archive card in Strixhaven revitalize, which is one in a white, gain three, draw a card. This costs an extra mana for potion of healing, and revitalize was not a good card. That was not a card that you would often play. Right. in Strixhaven and this is just more expensive to do so I just looked at it as like okay we already have a card that we don't really want to play in the previous set this one costs more obviously <laughs> that's a D or an F which is sure. why I gave it that designation but they said you could build around it and I consistently underrated the life gain theme in green and white mm. which triggers off of gaining life and that's why they said this might be playable if you need that trigger for your life gain deck. Okay. This works okay. Hmm. Yeah, so they gave it the C-, and 
I guess I under, when I initially saw the build around, that, I really had questions about that. So that makes a little like, bit more sense. It? Yeah, this this definitely seems more last resort. Um, I gave it a C, and I still think I'm a little high on that one. Actually, I would probably go closer to C minus on this one. Um, yeah, it is another one of those cards where I kind of like that. I'm like, I can't believe I'm getting giving D's and F's already. <laughs> that was well, one I, of those things. But it, it's not great. It, no. it really isn't. No. The trick with modern sets is that, and they talk about this on the show even, is that D's and F's don't mean what they used to. You know, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. old sets, D and F meant like this card literally doesn't do anything in your deck. Like yeah. you're playing a blank. And that doesn't really happen that much in modern sets, especially at common and uncommon. So sure. like Potion of Healing or Revitalize, honestly, they're not bad cards. Like you won't mm -hmm. be sad to put them in your deck. The only reason you don't want to put them in is there are even better things that you could be doing with them. Sure. So I, I, I don't think you're wrong in thinking that they play fine. Okay. Yeah, that, and that's, that's a good point. I think that is why I was a little bit nicer to these cards in general because I was like, well, I, I hate to say dear and because I, I do think that, you know, like, I guess I have the old school thought of these are just unplayable. Right. And it's like, this isn't unplayable. So, but yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, right. That makes sense. All right, what do you got next? Well, I guess in the theme of unplayable cards this is one that i think is unplayable which uh, the rest of the group just disagrees with me on so uh ranger's hawk uh let me read this card real quick uh, it costs one white uh it is a bird common uh, one one flying you pay three you tap it and you tap another untapped creature you control and then you can venture into the dungeon activate only as a sorcery um and just real simply for me, I guess maybe this is like going back into, I, I really want to know what your thoughts are on this. Yes. Creature. But like, I look at this and I say, do I really want to pay three, tap this creature and tap another one just to venture? I don't think that's good. And I don't think that's just going to cut the mustard for this one. So I rate, rate that as a or an F. Um, mm -hmm. You rank this as a C minus. So you're, you're saying it's I'm pretty really nice. playable. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're not far off. Uh, LR... Uh, C plus for this one, so there's there's a difference here with this one. Yeah, for sure. Well, this one kind of was me trying to learn my lesson from our previous episodes, where mm. one one flyers for one, they have really come around on. Sure. And and so I was like, maybe there's something here. But even looking at, I mean, I gave it a C minus. I said sure. barely playable. Yeah. Because I agree with you. If you took the same card. One mana, one one flyer, three tap venture. Even if you got rid of the extra clause where you need another creature to tap right. to do this, get rid of that. Mm -hmm. Imagine this alternate world where it's just one mana, one one flyer, three tap venture. That's a lot of mana it to is. do something that's not that exciting. Exactly. So this is maybe this is a good time to talk about venture and how we think about it. Sure. Okay. So Venture is another example of recent mechanics where Wizards is trying to give you lots of things that you can do to gain value. So we had the double face cards, we had lessons and learn. We've had this pattern recently of you always have something to do with your mana and mm -hmm. evening out your draws. And venturing into the dungeon seems similar. It seems like more of that where you always have something that you're getting a little bit of an advantage. Now, looking at the things that your dungeons can do, they're obviously on average not very exciting. Sure. You're talking about like scrying one, drawing a card, making a 1-1 one, one goblin, that kind of thing. And then eventually it will pay off. So I was trying to come up with a heuristic of, on average, what is venture worth? Okay, well, that's and interesting. It, and in my head, basically, when I was grading these cards, I replaced Venture with Scry 2. It's not as good as drawing a card. I'd rather draw a card than Scry 2. Okay. But Scry 2 is pretty nice. And so that's basically what I did with these cards. Okay. So, so I imagine Ranger's Hawk as a 1 white mana, 1-1 one, one flyer, that for 3, tap, and tap another creature, you Scry 2. <laughs> which is, is not very good. Sure. 
But I was also thinking it's a 1-1 flyer, which they have come around to like. So I gave it a little bump. I okay. think I basically started it where you were at, D or F. But I was sure. like, eh, they kind of like these cards now. Little bump. They, they do. And with the amount of equipment that is in this set here, right. I, could, I can definitely see a world where this is a little bit better. So how did you go about thinking about dungeons and venturing? Dungeons for me, I didn't really have a set uh, bar per se, like using this uh, Scry 2 as the level there. So I was more trying to think, okay, is this something that I would actively want to do? Or like, is there efficiency? Because I guess just a little bit of background on my playstyle, I really enjoy those incremental advantages. Uh, so I play, like, Jump is a classic example. That's one of my favorites mm -hmm. uh, style of deck. So any chance I can get just a little bit of advantage and squeeze out just a little bit more, so like a two for one is great. Um, you know, just getting those incremental advantages over your opponent to be able to win the game. Really like that. So I'll look at that to see uh, like what's the mana cost or what do I have to do in order to actually get to this kind of thing. And I just kind of weigh out the balance. Um, again, not really having like a standardized. Uh, payoff per se by venturing, but I just look at like what kind of costs are associated to get it, and then I just make my judgment based off that. Gotcha. So it's very kind of ticky tacky kind of science there with that, but um, more card by card. It, it is. I, I try to judge just based on the card itself, and yeah, like Ranger's Hawk is a great example of something I would not do, and so that's yeah. that's why I gave it the deer out. I do not think I would play this card. If I gave it a grade for my play rate, I would give it a D or F. I'm sure. not going to draft this card. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, even seeing LC or sorry LR's uh, rating with C plus, I don't know how much that moves the needle for me. In all honesty, I really I, don't. I, I don't think so. I mean, yeah. I have not been a big fan of white black for recent sets, but I know the white black is the is one of the delving venturing sets so sure. maybe this yeah. one will change my mind maybe this will be a better version i know at time of recording it's july 12th lsv's first draft is on youtube and he went for a white black venturing deck okay it, it worked out pretty well okay very so, good who knows who knows time will tell all right let's move on though to blue where i okay. see we both have a comment on a card called fly <laughs> Very simply, fly. Yes. Yeah. One blue mana, an enchantment aura. It gives the enchanted creature flying, and when it deals damage to a player, venture into the dungeon. Now, I gave this a C plus. You gave it a C minus. They gave it a B minus. So they really like this card, and we're not quite as strong on it. This is an interesting one. Uh, the note that I took here is that Luis who we defer to, gave this a B minus. Marshall gave this a D plus. Mm. So that is a huge difference in yeah. grades. Luis is saying this is like a, I will first pick this card. It's good enough to first pick. It's kind of like in high impact bombish territory. And Marshall is giving a grade that says, I would not feel great about even putting this in my deck ever. So that's gigantic. And also, you and I kind of differ quite a bit on this. We're yeah, much we closer than they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are, and I kind of take Marshall's approach where it's, I, I think this comes down to, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this one. So, like, even flying aside, like, it's kind of your position on what venturing does for how, you. Like, how what, what your position is on venturing. Yeah. And if you listen to a previous podcast where we initially talk about venturing, um, mm -hmm. I'm all for it. And I still think it's great. I just don't think that these cards necessarily that are currently available to us, I think there will be future dungeons. Uh -huh. um, I think there will be more dungeons that will allow cards to make better use of them. Do more things with venturing. Do more things. Yeah, exactly. And it honestly could wreck magic as, as a game, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Yeah, but that aside, I don't think the 
for a blue mana and every time it deals combat damage. Now, again, I kind of missed that there's a lot of um, can't be blocked creatures. Yes, uh, there are. there's a lot of those, so I didn't have that really taken into account here uh, whenever I looked holistically uh, mm -hmm. at the set. So that's kind of on me. I'd probably bump this up closer to the city, honestly, at this point. Um, but that's that's a that's either here or there. Um, I don't think Venture is going to do that much for you to where I would want to actively pick this card over maybe some choice uncommons or maybe some rares and yeah. set. So while I don't agree with the B minus, um, I don't really agree with the D plus either. I am and my grade reflects that somewhere in yeah, the middle. You're, you're yeah, you're in between. Yeah. I think it's interesting, like Marshall's whole stance, he tends to be a very conservative player. And from his perspective, it's like, what are you what's your play pattern with this? Mm -hmm. You you play a one or two mana creature, you put fly on it, and you start attacking. Mm -hmm. If they have any removal spell, you get two for one. Sure. That's why he just gives it a D. He's like, it's just too risky. And Luis thinks the payoff adventure is good enough that it's worth going for it, even if you might get two for one. He's like, you only need to hit once or twice, and you've already made your card back. And sometimes they just won't have an answer for it. Got a risk versus reward. Yes. Yeah. This is this is a weird card. It's kind of like Curiosity, the enchantment that lets yes. you you put it on a card and when it or a creature, and when it hits them, you draw a card. But this this gives them the evasion. It gives them flying. But you're not getting a full card back when you do it. So that's a really weird card to try to evaluate. I mean, it's very appropriate that this card is so swingy between them because this could be the one of the best cards in the set, or it could be nothing. Like, yeah, it really could go either way. Yeah, it truly really depends on how strong venture is. Yeah, it really does. I that's my suspicion is kind of that. The last few sets, the double face cards, the lesson and learn, mm -hmm. like I think it's going to be good because that's what they've been doing recently. Yeah, like, I agree. This whole incremental advantage thing has been very big. So I think it's going to go up rather than down. I would agree with that. I think that's a very fair assessment. All right, but speaking of uh, hitting your opponents and getting some card advantage, uh, I see you have another card selected here. Yeah, it's actually, I just thought this would be a really good example. It's uh, mm -hmm. Guilt, Guilt Thief. Uh, it's one in the blue. It's a, it's a orc rogue. It's an uncommon. It's a 1-1. One, one. Uh, whenever this card deals combat damage to a player, put a plus one, plus one player on it. Uh, it also has Cunning Action, which is for three blue. Uh, Guilt Thief can't be blocked this turn. So if you equip that with Fly, that's a pretty good card. Yeah, you're getting a plus one, plus one counter and venturing whenever it hits. Yeah, that's and, that's and it gonna flies. be a, it's a quick <laughs> clock at that point. Yeah, yeah. So I think there are some really good uh, uh, interactions with fly. You know, I don't even care about the grades on this. I just think this is more just a. I do. Uh, yeah, there, we have a little bit of a difference on this one here, but uh, I, at the end of the day, though, I think this is like depending on what your thoughts are on venture. I think you know, I can also make guild beef a good card or a bad card. Yeah, and I think, well, I'll let you talk about the grades, but uh, yeah, we definitely have differences in opinions on Guild Thief and like what it could be. Yeah, so Seth gave it a C. I gave it a D or F. LR gave it a B minus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's pretty awesome. I, I think this is another one where I was trying to learn my lesson from previous sets. Okay. They, tip, they typically don't like cards where you have to pay mana to make a small creature unblockable. Mm-hmm. This one they like, um, and really the strength that they found in this card is on the occasions where you play it on turn two and your opponent can't get rid of it and can't block it. It just, yeah, it just spirals from there. It has some intense cheese factor. Um, sure. And, that, and that's ignoring what you're talking about, where there are extra synergies going on. And then later, you know, let's say you played on turn two, they can't block it on turn three, you put a couple of counters on it, and now all of a sudden you're attacking, and you can pay four to make it unblockable as a four four that's getting bigger every turn. That's mostly what they gave it a good grade for. It's just okay. the cheese potential. Okay, that's fair. 
But, I mean, you're right. There are, Besides that, there are a lot of combos with it. And I don't know. I basically looked at a two-mana 1-1, one, one, and I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's true. The thing is, like, if you don't get this on turn two... It's not a very good card. You don't want to say this on turn 5 or 6. No. At all. No. Now you have a 2 mana 1-1 one, one that doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Or will take multiple turns in your entire mana pool to grow a little yeah. bit. So it really is the cheese potential, which I typically don't like cheese cards. Yeah. I, yeah. Doesn't mean they can't be good, but... I'm thinking about that's why I don't like aggro decks in general is sure. because you're trying to get the perfect draw that will just kill your opponent by turn six, you know, mm -hmm. and if something goes wrong, you don't have cards that will do anything about it. Sure. But I don't know. Maybe this is going to get there. It could. I think it can truly go either way. I, I took the safe road. I went right down the middle. Yeah. Um, I, I would venture to guess. Either this is maybe your defeat or victory card. This could definitely yeah, be one I, of them. I, I agree. That's what I was thinking, too. <laughs> yep. All right, next up in blue, Power of Persuasion. Yeah. yeah. This is two and a blue, a sorcery, a new mechanic that we, haven't, we have not discussed yet. No. Choose target creature and opponent controls, then roll a d20, 20-sided dice. If you get a 1 through a 9, you bounce it to their hand. If you get a 10 to 19... You put it on top or bottom of their library, their choice. On a 20, you gain control of it until the end of your next turn. I gave this a C plus. You gave it a B minus. They gave it a D or an F. One thing they talk about on their show quite frequently is when you see a card that looks kind of weird or kind of janky or kind of bad, but you see it's an uncommon you need to take a minute and think about it because mm -hmm. maybe they moved it to uncommon because it's better than it looks actually. So I looked at this card and I was like, I don't totally see it, but it's uncommon. So mm -hmm. maybe it's better than it looks. Sure. So I, I bumped it up to a C plus and they said, just don't play it. Mm. The thing that was interesting to me in hearing Luis and Marshall's conversation about this card is that with these roll of D twenties, they come in kind of two different varieties. One variety is it's like a coin flip. One to nine, you get a minor effect. 10 to 20, you get a great effect. And then there's another variety like this one where it's the same thing, but if you roll exactly a 20 on a 20-sided dice, you get an amazing effect. Right. But they pointed out that rolling the 20 on this card is actually worse than the 10 so, to 19. It's funny because that's actually my least favorite mode of this. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah. You gain control of it on your turn as a sorcery. You don't get to attack with their creature. It doesn't have haste. So you sit there. Next mm -hmm. turn you get one attack, and then they get their creature back for yeah. free. That's worse than just giving it back to them on top or bottom of their library. Yeah. So it's a really weird card. Yeah, it, it is weird. And I, I don't know. I, I like the disruption that the... Uh, 1 through 19 has. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, I did bump it up a little bit more. I originally had a C plus on this one. I bumped it up to B minus because it was a, um, an uncommon. Mm -hmm. Now, I use this more as a sideboard card, personally. Um, okay. Just, just because, like, if it's very, like, creature heavy or if you have, like, that one, like, super disruptive creature that you just need to get, need rid, to get of. rid of yeah. yeah i think it's i think it's really handy there it's just it's its own way of not destruction per se but it, it just disrupts and i thought that was pretty good so um i went more sideboard b with it but i would probably say just like in general be closer to what you were saying it's like a c plus um it's good filler like it's it's not something you're actually going to choose towards um yeah. but i think if you're already in blue and some sort of a removal spell of some sort. I think this is perfectly fine. Yeah, you won't be embarrassed about this card. No, I don't think so. I think definitely the fail case is... I mean, 20 is, like, weird. You don't really have to worry about it because it's, like, 5% chance. Mm -hmm. But 1 to 9... Imagine if this card just said 2 and a blue sorcery, bounce a creature to its owner's hand. 
That would not be very good. Right. And that's what this is going to be about half the time. Sure. So that's like not a good starting point. Now, the only the only uh, thing I would say is like if you had all day fair day, who's helping you roll yeah. multiple dice, what have you? Now you're probably gonna have more chance to get that twenty as well too. So that's gonna suck. <laughs> but uh, that's I, true. I think the red blue, you have more of a chance to kind of manipulate really what you're gonna get. So I think you'd have more of a chance. And also, getting, you get more rewarded for rolling dice in general as well. You do. You do. So I, I don't think it's necessarily going to be tough to get the 10 to 19. Yeah. Uh, so I, I kind of looked at it that way. And so, I thought, well, okay, if you could just put like a dinky creature on top, or if you put a really tough creature to deal with on bottom, I think I think that would be doing just fine. Because they're gonna... Gotcha. Yeah. Next up, we've got Split the Party, which we both fucked up on. Yeah, we have a split party on this one here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I gave it a C plus, you gave it a B minus. We are both very close. They gave it a D or an F. What is the card? So, Split the Party is three and two blue. It's an uncommon sorcery. Choose target player. Return half of the creatures they control to their owner's hand. Round it up. And I like the flavor text on this one. Simply don't. <laughs> don't split the party. Just don't. And that's what they said on the show as well. They're like, should we play this card? Don't. Hmm. Interesting. So one of my notes here, let me ask you, what does this card do? More specifically, who gets to choose the creatures? So for me, yeah, it's it's one of those things where, yeah, who, who does pick the creatures on that one? You pick the creatures, or do they? Turn half of the creatures they control to their own skin. It seems like you choose the creatures. You, the caster of this spell. You, the caster, yes. That is correct, as far okay. as I understand. You do. Okay. But it's funny, on the podcast, they had to debate back and forth and had to ask their listeners who gets to choose. So this definitely wins the award for me of worst templated card. <laughs> because it's very much not clear what happens when you cast a spell. Yeah, I think there is that understood or implied view of the caster. Yeah. But, yeah, that but, is tough. But you also don't target the creatures. And it doesn't say that you choose the creatures. You're just choosing a player. Choose the player. But it's choose a target player. <laughs> but you don't choose or target any creatures. Okay. It's a weird card. Uh, very. It reads very simply, but it's actually a very confusing card. It really is. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I didn't put that much thought into it. I just read it as, like, I choose them. I'm just going to return half of your big creatures on there. Or, like, if you have a bunch of tokens, just that would just remove all your tokens. I did the same thing. I assumed that you pick. But yeah. they started reading it, and Marshall was like, oh... This sucks, like, because you don't get to choose. And Luis is like, do you, though? Interesting. I'm really curious what that's going to end up being. I So, from what I understand from the listeners of their show, who are pretty on the ball, they seem to think you, the caster of Split the Party, get to pick the cards. Now, they eventually understood that, and even with that information, they still said D or F. Interesting. So imagine a board with four creatures. You're paying five mana to bounce two creatures. How good is that? Yeah. Not that good. No, it's not. And I, I for some reason, I had this go wide strategy going mm -hmm. in this in, uh, in this set. And I was mm -hmm. thinking it'd be a little bit more powerful. Um, but yeah, like if just in limited in general. If you're able to get, you know, like in a case like this, if you're able to get two creatures, maybe three since it's rounded up. Right. That's about, that's probably about the max you're going to get. Right. Is that good enough for five mana? And that's I in a situation know. where your opponent has a big board. Do you want to be in a position where your opponent has a lot of creatures? No, because then you're probably playing from behind. That. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it... it the thing, I mean, I did not do very well rating this card. Um, 
in the previous two sets they've had six mana spells that just straight up let you bounce creatures and it doesn't care how many they have and lets you do other things besides that like draw cards or they stay tapped or you know stuff like that mm -hmm. this is not as good as that yeah that's fair I, I would agree with that so just a weird card overall it is very weird all right what do you got up next okay well we're gonna go to the next card alphabetically this is these are probably my two biggest misses mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. compared to lr here so the next one here is sudden insight mm -hmm. and sudden insight is four colorless and two blue uh it's an uncommon instant. Draw a card for each different mana value among non-land cards in your graveyard. I gave this a B, and both you and LR gave this a D or an F. My thought on this one here is, you know, it's a, it's a later, like, mid-range control card, later control, you got, you know, six mana, no problem. It's an instant mm -hmm. into your turn. I'm sure you're going to have some creatures, instant sorceries in your deck. Uh, I'm sorry, in your graveyard, and you can easily draw three, I would think, three to five cards later in the yeah. game for this. So yeah. I I look at that, and I'm like, yeah, I can play that. I think I was, I think my uh, grade is a little high for what it could have been, or, like, looking back at it now, but I'm still probably going to say D-minus at that point. I, I don't know if I would act, well, now I'm already talking myself down with this, yeah. here, but I don't know if I necessarily, like, uh, pick this over some know, mediocre rares or anything like that. So probably closer to the C plus, but I wouldn't just right not play this one. I don't know. Am, am I just missing something here? Well, let me ask you this: okay. in a modern limited set, what would you give a five mana draw three? In a modern set, a modern limited set. I'm not saying like a modern set, but like oh, okay. in a okay. set like the ones we're talking about. Five mana, draw three. What would you give that card? I would like that card. I would give that one probably like a B minus at that point. So this is worse than that because it's an extra mana, but not necessarily an extra card That's at that fair. point. That's fair. So that brings it down a little bit. I mean... What would you ideally like if imagine you're designing a card mm -hmm. and you want it to be a B, like a first pickable card, six mana, how many cards should that draw you? I would say for me at that point, probably four. That yeah, I'd I would say four or five. Like yeah. somewhere in between there. Yeah. And this doesn't necessarily do that. It reminds me a lot of the last set, uh, Golden Ratio. Do you remember that card? Oh yes, I do. That was one green blue draw a card for each different uh, power among creatures you control, and it was a very similar thing of like in your head you're like, oh my god, this could draw me so many cards. Yeah. But there are situations where you would cast this and it would draw you like two cards. That's fair. Or, or one card. It's just too situational, and at that point you'd just rather have like a three mana draw two, like something more consistent. Right. This yeah, card is fair. like this card, and this is another good lesson that we can learn here. I think you need to look at these draw cards and say, is this better or worse mm -hmm. than divination? Yeah, that's a good point. Because this does eat up your entire turn as well. It does. Yeah, it's a it's an upside play. Like if you feel like, ooh, if you're like salivating at the idea of drawing six cards for six mana, that sounds great. But it if does, you're yeah. looking at it like, ooh, I think a lot of times I'm going to draw two to three cards for six mana. That's not worth it. Yeah. So what you talk about as well in yeah. modern sets, like there's just not as many turns where you have nothing to do. This is true. There's always something to do. You always have cards in hand. You like in Strixhaven, you're just constantly being refueled by lessons. So. You didn't never had to really worry about things. Mm -hmm. In uh, call time, you were using uh, Fortel to constantly have more cards going on. Yeah. So, and here you're gonna have dungeons. Like you're not gonna run out of things to do. And six mana instant draw cards that do nothing else suffer when that's the case. That's interesting. So does divination even have a place in today's limited? If you print it, I think if you put straight up divination in this set, it would not look very good. They it do really have wouldn't. a card in blue. Uh, I can't remember which card it is. Maybe it is wizard class, actually. 
It is, yeah. So real quick, let me read okay. this card. Yeah. Wizard class is a single blue for an enchantment class. <laughs> Level one, you have no maximum hand size. <laughs> Whatever, who gives a shit? Yeah. You pay three more mana. You draw two cards. There's your divination. Mm -hmm. And then level three, you pay five mana. Whenever you draw a card, put a 1-1 counter on target creature you control. So every turn, you're putting at least one counter on creatures you control. Right. So this is very similar to divination. It just does a lot more. Yes, it does. So you really like this card. I love this one. You gave us an A-. I mm -hmm. gave it a C. I just want to say real quick... I sucked ass on the class cards. <laughs> I did so bad on them. They gave it a B. Um, I was I was pretty far off on this, but you really like this card. I love this one. Absolutely love it. You get to draw cards, and then at the very end, you make your own, I don't know if people will remember, Consecrated Sphinx. Mm -hmm. You make your own Consecrated Sphinx, essentially, at that point. Yeah. Uh, with no maximum hand size, you can just draw cards all day long. And I think this is an excellent, excellent card. Yeah, I think this is very worthy of name minus here. The thing, here's my thing about the classes. Okay. And why I did not, I graded them poorly compared to LR. It's so much mana. Like, it is. This is. This is four mana to draw two cards. And then another five mana. And then you have to get to your next turn. And then you start putting counters on creatures. That's fair. That's fair. My only counter to that is uh, when we went over to Kaldheim and we had the, what was the mechanic where you would uh, cast it for less and have it face down? Fortel. Fortel. This reminds me a lot of Fortel, and they tended to like Fortel. Yeah, um, I that's true. I kind of associated this with Fortel. Um, you, you pay the one blue and you don't care, and yep. eventually you have a random time where you have three mana available. You draw your cards. Correct. You have a random turn where you have five mana available late in the game. You yep. get this bonus. That was my thought with this one. It's, it's something to do. And that actually kind of goes back to what you were saying about uh, the previous card that we were talking about with the uh, Sudden Insight. Right. You know, there's really not much place for Sudden Insight if you already have a wizard class. That A is already doing right. that technically more efficiently. And Much more. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we can pay this at any time. So if there's, like, something I want to do, I might as well just dump more mana into this wizard class. Right, right. Yeah. No, it's a good point. Well, you nailed that one. I definitely did not. I, I still think <laughs> they could be higher on it, actually. <laughs> well, speaking of going higher, let's talk about uh, dragons. Ooh, okay. Um, there's a cycle of uncommons for each color of chromatic dragons. Now, I have not seen your grades for the other ones. Uh, I'm looking at black dragon right now. Mm -hmm. We both gave it C+. Yep. We are an entire letter grade behind LR that gave it a B+. Mm -hmm. So let me read the card. Black Dragon is a 7 mana, 5 and 2 black creature dragon, 4-4 four, four flying. It has acid breath. When it comes into play, target creature gets minus three, minus three until end of turn. So how do you feel like you did on the dragon cycle? These, This is a cycle of dragons that cost either six or seven mana for four, four flyers that have various effects when they yeah. come into play or attack. Yeah, I had my personal notes. I thought black dragon was the weakest of them. Um, I was kind of lackluster on them. And I thought the blue and the black dragons were probably my least favorites of mm -hmm. the sets, and I graded them accordingly with C pluses. The rest of them, I believe I gave B minuses to. I'm actually really surprised to see a B plus on this one. Um, I, you you consistently did better on the dragons than I did. What, did you just, were you just not impressed with them overall? Uh, what, uh, I, what did you not like that? I, I personally, I'm with you. I don't like that this must set before. Yeah, exactly. You hit it on the head. I was low on all of them compared to LR, because... I mean, we're coming off of a couple reviews ago. We did uh, Cons of Tarkir. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Sorry. We did Fate Reforged. Fate, Fate Reforged. Reforged. Okay. And they had a cycle of dragons that cost six or seven mana for four, four flying dragons. And they were not impressed with them. And, you know, these don't seem much better to me. Um, seven mana for a four, four flyer kind of sucks. Yeah. And at the point where you're paying seven mana, 
giving a creature minus three minus three just isn't that good i don't think it's not i mean i, I think about sorry go ahead well i was the only thing i was gonna say is i noticed there's a lot of cards that um either depend on or add treasure tokens so yeah. i think you can kind of cheat it in a little bit sooner but still a seven mana i think this is just a really ambitious use of your mana yeah definitely I mean, I think one thing that's weird to me is in this set review, there is a five mana three three flyer in white, I believe, mm -hmm. that has some, some minor upside. And they take the time to point out in the olden days of limited, uh, with old border cards, that would have been really nice. Mm -hmm. That would have been one of the best creatures you could have. And nowadays, that just does not cut it. Yeah. That is not efficient enough. Here you're talking about two extra mana for one extra power and toughness. And yes, it does have the ability to snipe a small creature, but sure. I just don't think that's good enough. And this set has lots of reach creatures. It mm -hmm. has two different plummets. I just don't think you're going to be wanting to put seven mana into a creature like this. Mm -hmm. Just for discussion purposes, we're yeah. just going to go back one. And I, I see your grades right now. You grade Black Dragon higher than this one, but I do want to ask you the question. Would you rather have Baleful Beholder at four and two black? So six mana versus the seven mana the Black Dragon. Uh, let me read the Baleful Beholder real quick. Yeah, go for it. So it's creature, it's a Beholder, it's a six five, and when Baleful Beholder enters the battlefield, choose one. You can anti magic cone, each opponent sacrifices an enchantment, that's what it is. Uh, the second one here is the one I'm more interested in, the Theater Ray. Creatures you control gain menace until end of turn. Now, I think Baleful Beholder is a better finisher because of the menace ability, and it's a 6 5 to boot. Now, neither one of them have uh, haste or anything like that. Right. But I think that I personally would rather have Baleful Beholder in, if I were just to choose between the two because I think Baleful Beholder is a lot stronger finisher. Yeah. So, I think. I think you might be right. Um, I think I might revise my grade and agree with you because being one mana cheaper mm -hmm. goes a very long way. It does. Um, and and we shouldn't discount the anti-magic cone. Each opponent sacrifices an enchantment because right. there are some enchantments in this set, a handful, that are like um, keep your creature tapped, mm -hmm. like pacifisms, that kind of thing. And a six mana six five that unlocks one of your good creatures mm -hmm. is is great. Yes, it is. Pushing through damage is great. Six mana six five is a great body. It is. I it it might just be better. I mean, the allure of the black dragon is the two for one, right? Well, sure. Like you get a four four flyer, and you kill something, but six five menace your entire team mm -hmm. might just be straight up better. I think that, you're right. That is the game. I, yeah. Especially, like, that's what I'm looking for whenever I'm just wanting to finish a game. So I think it's very strong. So, yeah, I would I'd definitely choose it over uh, Black Dragon. And you rated it accordingly. I did, yes. I gave uh, Baleful Beholder B- versus a C plus on the Black Dragon. I, I kind of agree with you. No. Yeah. Interesting. Just interesting stuff to, to think about. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting to dispute these points. A mm -hmm. deadly dispute, if you will. Ooh, I love <laughs> it. So your next card is? Deadly dispute. <laughs> 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 uh, all right, so this one here. Uh, this one actually just goes more towards, like, just the theme of black. Um, I'll go ahead and read this one here, but then I'll, I'll get on my... High horse. question. Yeah, not even a. What's the opposite of a high horse? I'm just a getting, low donkey. Oh, okay. I'll talk about my <laughs> low donkey here. <laughs> my hanging donkey. Oh no! <laughs> I'm gonna get drunk for this one. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> um, one of the black. It's an instant. As an additional cost to cast a spell, sacrifice an artifact or creature. Draw two cards and create a treasure token. I think that sounds pretty good. Um, I gave it a C plus. I mean, I'm not gonna go out of my way to pick it or anything. Like C plus, you gave it a C minus. I gave this a D or an F. Mm -hmm. Um, 
just like my overarching question is like, am I just missing something with black? Because I thought it was one of the stronger sets. I only have one DRF in here, and like, oh yeah, there's a lot of DRFs. Yeah, they're throwing DNFs out like it's beads and Mardi Gras. I don't, I don't get it, but you know, not the professional either. So this was uh, I, don't I know. went. I went way out on a limb in this entire set. I I also gave out a lot of Ds or Fs. Like looking at this section, your grades versus mine, I mm -hmm. have a lot more Ds or Fs than you do. Yeah. And I was very nervous about putting them out there because I was sure. like, I was like, am I missing something? Because mm -hmm. these cards don't seem very good. Yeah. The issue with this card is you pay two mana and sacrifice something, so you're paying two cards, sure. and you're getting back two cards and a treasure mm -hmm. so at the end of this deal where you paid two mana you're up a treasure token sure so would you pay a mana for a treasure and a card it's not like it's that bad yeah you know? yeah and that's that's a big commonality between a lot of these d's and f's that's why there are so many i think sure they're not bad you will not play these cards and lose because you played them but they just look bad by comparison to other cards. Yeah, no, that's that's very fair, and yeah, it just I know, like I look at these cards, and yeah, to your point, it's like it doesn't seem like it's that bad, so I don't want to go with the deer app. So that's usually like the first thing I'll mark out. Like it, whenever I look at a card, my first question is, is this a deer or an app or something right. else? And I'll go yes, no, and then I'll move on from there. Right. With a lot of these cards, I'm like, I wouldn't change. I, I wouldn't consider these a DR now, but, you know, we are trying to think of what uh, limited right. resources is, is thinking of there. So, this card uh, feels kind of like a faithless looting. I, like that's what I thought of. You're about. discarding some cards and drawing some cards. And the problem with that card is it's amazing and constructed where you can build around it. Mm -hmm. It's never been that good and limited. Yeah, and that's true. And I think I overvalued the treasure token as well because that allows you to be more multicolored at that point. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, if you're like a, I thought black red was like a really good um, archetype for for this set. So like if I you know, was just had two swamps and I had this card right here and like a couple red spells in my hand, yeah, yeah, I could probably do something with that or if i was like venturing and then i have like this random one one goblin for one of the one of the dungeons and right whenever i venture to sacrifice that that goblin and then i draw two cards and get a treasure token out of that uh, yeah. to me i think that seems pretty good again not like you know i gave this a c uh, it was in the c category so it's not like i'm actively like trying to find this not, card not pick it or anything, but i'm not yeah i'm not sad to play it or anything uh, right so yeah, that's just a, just a difference of philosophy there at that point, I believe. Yep. Now now tell me about this card. So, okay. Rider. This really is, sweet artwork, by the way. Yes. I, I like this so. a lot, yeah. This is four and a black for a 4-3 elf spider reach. When it deals combat damage to a player, you make a 2-1 black spider creature token with menace and reach. Mm-hmm. You gave it a B. They gave it a B. I gave it a C minus. Okay. So it was really far off. Tell me about your thought process, because you definitely had a, a better beat on this one than I did. Sure. Well, it kind of goes back to a conversation we had um, where it kind of faltered out for that particular card. I'm drawing a blank on what, uh, what card that was. But this one here, um, I think of it as uh, six power, four toughness, both reach. One of them has menace, which I think. I like the menace mechanic. I think that will yeah. actually get a lot of damage through because you don't really want to block with two creatures, you know, especially if one of them had like death touch or one of them had power. Right. Um, that can be very debilitating. So, and both of them have reach at that point too. So that's that's good too. And so menace and reach, I think, are a weird combination. Honestly, Definitely. I, I really <laughs> do. It's weird. like okay, menace you want to attack with, reach you want to block with. So yeah. like that's this is one of those cards that kind of have this isn't the specific card that has the identity crisis that I'm thinking of, but this definitely but has it, it as well. It. Yeah. So yeah, I went with that route. It's just a lot of power, a lot of toughness split amongst uh, uh, 
multiple creatures. So I thought this one had some good merit to it. I would definitely, if if this came into play and made that token, I think I would be on board. Mm -hmm. I would be down for that. My issue is, and and tell me where I'm thinking wrong. Okay. You're paying five mana for a four three, mm -hmm. and now you need to get this through on combat before you get your token back. Right. The issue I took is that you're paying five mana for a four or three, which will lose to three mana creatures. Yeah. And that seems dubious. It does. Um, is the idea that its power is so high that you can force the issue with your opponent? Yeah, I mean, like it's a four or three you have to deal with at some point. Or it, it's another one of those things where it's going to snowball. Uh, to where right. If you don't deal with it, if you get right. two, three spiders out there, well, okay, let's say you had three spiders out there as one case. That's ten power. Right. Six of that has menace. Yep. You're not going to deal You can't deal with that. So, like, this is one of those parts where it's like, you need to deal with this now or else you're going to be done. Yep. Like, this will lose you the game. That seems to be what LR said, too. They said, yeah. if this hits you once, you basically win the game. Like, yeah. you get one of these spiders, like, you're just so far ahead. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. I just didn't get to, like there's tension you mentioned with the uh the token. There's this tension between menace is like a good attacking stat, yeah. reach is a good defensive stat. Yeah. This the drider itself is the same way. You want to attack with it to get the token, right. but it has reach and high power, so you want to hold it back on defense. Yeah. I think it just makes it a very like flexible card. It's like a it sweet does. defensive card and a sweet offensive card. Just right. depends on what you need at the time. Exactly. I mean, if you get this thing vigilance, holy shit, this thing yeah, be awesome. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you'd be rocking. Yeah, exactly. All right. What do you think about going to red? Let's go to red. You don't have a lot of uh, notes down here. I don't actually. Just so, like little, just little notes here and there. Here and there. Yeah. Well, let's go to one that we both have notes on. Oh okay. my god, this fucking card. <laughs> I'm going to hoarding ogre. Okay. So this is the one. The, yep. This is the one it. that I asked, is this a trap? I'm pissed off. <laughs> Hoarding Ogre. Three and a red, a creature ogre, a 3-3. Three, three. That's right, it's a hill giant. Literally the same stats as a hill giant. Three and a red for a 3-3. Three, three. When it attacks, you roll a d20. On a 1-9, to nine, you get a treasure token. On a 10 to 19, you get two treasure tokens. And on a 20, you get three treasure tokens. Now, as we have discussed, we have the hill giant fallacy that I have fallen into time and time again. In fact, my defeat card at the beginning of this episode was the hill giant fallacy. So I looked at this and I said, it's okay. But I was like, I've learned my lesson. I've grown as a person. I'm going to deduct this a full letter grade, which puts it into the dear F category. <laughs> They gave it a C. <laughs> yeah. And you gave it a B minus. I guess so a B you, minus, yeah. You wound up closer than I was to it, so. Now, let me just explain my reasoning. Okay. Hill Giant, fallacy, obviously. But four mana three three. Those obviously are not good stats. You sure. would not just you would not play that in your deck. Sure. That would be a D or an F. Yep. When it attacks, on average, you make one and a half treasures. Yeah. To me, that, that fell into the definition of minor upside on a hill giant. So I was like, I've fallen into this trap too many times before. Hill giant with minor upside is a D or an F. So that's what I gave it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, well, again, going back to red blue as wanting to roll multiple dice in mm -hmm. the best one, I really think you have a really good chance of getting two or more yeah. uh, for this one here. So I looked at it honestly as I'm probably Game creating card. two treasures at this point. So if I play this on turn four and you know it does not have haste, um, so turn five comes over there, first main phase, you know, probably not even do anything. I'll just attack with this boarding over here. Do my roll. Let's just say I get two treasure tokens. Now I've got seven mana that I can work with, assuming I don't have any other treasures. And I can play a big card at that point. Um, I think there's a lot more upside with this one. My eyes are probably a little bit 
bigger on this one here after seeing that. That's why I wondered if it was a big track card for me as well. <laughs> um, so I would be minus on that one. I thought, hey, you know, like, again, treasure tokens, I think this also goes into, like, you know, treasure tokens have been around for a while now. So I yeah. think people understand the value of what a treasure token is. Um, yeah. I am probably a little bit higher on treasure tokens because everybody can use them. They're just, they're just good, solid, foundational uh, items for anybody's deck at that point. And this allows for using multicolor uh, decks and it smooths out your curves. It does all sorts of stuff. So I think of all those like fundamentals that it can do. And then I thought, well, okay, so this could be a B category here. But I won't give a full yep. B or anything like that. But I thought mm, this could be a B minus here at that point. So I would say C plus B minus range for me. I went with the B minus. Um, but uh, it looks you, like you went for it. Yeah. See. I did. I did. Also, Red Black's theme is making treasure tokens. It is. Which I think does. And then Red Blue's is rolling dice. So yeah. the fact that this does both of those things makes it a little more interesting. Yeah. I just, my note was, I feel betrayed. <laughs> like, I, the, I find I've tried to be more disciplined about Hill Giants this time. And I think two of the three that I graded, I got fucked on. Mm. So maybe I need to throw that rule in the garbage can. Or maybe this card will end up being bad. I guess we'll have to see. This could be the only exception. You never know. All right. All right. Uh, I guess real quick, I, we, I only have one other card that I want to talk about okay. in red. We're talking about Tiger Tribe Hunter. Okay. This reminds me of an old card from Mirrodin okay. that I loved. This is three red red for a four four trample, which reminds me of Fangren Hunter from Mirrodin, which that was the entire card. It was a five mana four four trample. And I love that card. This one has more though. This has pack tactics. Whenever it attacks, if you attacked with creatures with total power six or greater this combat, you can sacrifice another creature, and if you do, it deals damage equal to the sacrifice creature's power to target creature. So grade wise um, I gave this a C plus, as did you. They gave it a B plus. Mm. I, th- I should have given it a better grade because Fangren Hunter, a five mana four four trample, is business. That's like actually yeah. fairly serious stats. And this does more. And the big thing I missed out on, LSV pointed out this very simple play pattern. Once you have Tiger Tribe Hunter in play, all of your creatures that you have in hand turn into modal cards. Either you can play it as a creature oh. or play it as a removal spell for the, its mana value. Huh. And if you think of it that way, that's really sweet. That is really good. Like, you can just kill a creature every turn if it's advantageous. Or if it's better, like, if they don't have very many creatures, you just put more creatures into play. Mm-hmm. It, just, it just puts you in a really good position. And the fact is, with pack tactics, you need power six or greater. This already gives you four. Right. And you'll you'll probably already have pack tactics by the time this comes into play. Sure. So I think that's just a, a pattern that I did not see at all and makes a lot of sense to me. On top of just being a very solid body. Yeah. You know another thing too is that I totally glazed over the trample part of it just because yeah. it's just like this big wall of text. So I'm focused yeah. on that. And then there's trample just tucked away. I mean it's on top. Like it's just tucked away. Totally. So it's it's interesting. Yeah. This actually yeah. is a really good card. Yeah, I think it is too. If this were just a five minute four four with the rest of the text, it still might be okay. But the trample really puts it over the top. It does. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely missed on that one. Oh, I see you uh, had a card. I actually, yeah, <laughs> it was unexpected. Oh, I, but, I see yeah. why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's an unexpected change, but uh, here we are. So, unexpected windfall. Uh, it's two colorless and two red. It's an instant. It's an additional cost to cast the spell. This part of card. This and it goes back here. into... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I must be a button for punch. Uh, draw two cards and create two treasure tokens. And fortune favors the fortune. I wasn't very fortunate in this one, so... Or not, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I gave this one a B-. minus. Both you and uh, one of the resources gave this a D or an F. Um, but this kind of goes back to, like, could just discard a land card and draw two cards and create two treasure tokens. Mm. And I'm, that's just gas for me. I love that. Uh, yeah. But what? Uh, why did you not like this card? Four mana. 
I think Four this minutes. is just yeah. it's just too much time and mana sunk into at the end of it you have not gotten very far. Okay, that's fair. And that's why I also don't like the uh, classes, but mm. they like the classes. My yeah. problem with the classes is you take so many turns and so much mana dumping into them before they give you anything back. Mm -hmm. And this is very similar to me. They did point out that one cool thing about this is if you pass your opponent and at the end of their turn do this, you accelerate yourself by two treasures so right. you could play a big mana creature or sure. whatever and i think that is the good use case of it but um i think game in and game out you're not going to be in love with this card yeah well, that's fair yeah it just kind of goes back to that like you probably you're probably going to do other stuff yeah instead yeah i get that i get that like is this better than divination I don't think so. It's more one mana more, and it's also one card less that you get out of it. Yeah, that's fair. It's rough. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. I need to. Uh, I need to really pay attention whenever I'm grading this style of card. Where you're trading cards for mm -hmm. discards and yeah. mana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lesson learned. All right, how about we move over to green? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me think about which of these that I want to talk about, because yeah. I see that. Well, yeah, I didn't have anything. Just <laughs> That's because, fine. Yeah, so I will follow your lead on all those. So, like, any of those, like, oh, yeah, like, Druid class would be a good one to talk about. Okay. Let's yeah. talk about it, then. Okay. So, Druid class. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I messed up on all the classes and all the dragons. Druid class is one in the green for an enchantment. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life. That just sounds so minimal to me. <laughs> sure. Like a two mana life gain spell that will gain you a handful of life across the game. Okay, so you, but wait, you put three more mana into it. Now you're at five mana invested. You may play an additional land on each of your turns whatever <laughs> and gain two life <laughs> at the point where you've done this you have probably played out your lands you know yeah, that's fair like fast bond is not a good card in modern limited like one green mana and you can do that mm -hmm. so that seems really bad but at level three five more mana uh target land you control becomes a creature with haste and its power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control so at this point you have paid Ten? Ten mana. Yeah. Into this into this spell. And you have gotten a couple life and a creature. It just doesn't seem good enough. It doesn't seem like you are gonna want to do this game in, game out and, and pay this. Now, I gave it a dear F, yes? No? Yes. Yes, I did. Uh you gave it a B minus. They gave it a build around B, and I think again. The thing I missed out on consistently was the life gain theme mm -hmm, sure. being a thing in this set. Because they were basically saying, yeah, they didn't like level 2 on this card either. Um, and right. level 3 is hard to get to. It'll take a long time. But they're like, actually level 1, just getting constant, consistent life gain triggers mm -hmm, sure. is actually very good in the life gain deck. Okay. Now, why did you like it? I liked it. Well, I probably got more lucky on this one. I, I liked what they did. Like, just allowing to... I like this level 2 and level 3. The level gotcha. 1, I did not see the underlying... Or, yeah, the, I don't care about that. Yeah, I did not see the underlying theme of getting the life. I was like, oh, whatever. Like, that's, that's kind of... I just haven't Slightly seen, more. like, life gain is something they try to push every once in a while. Like, they were doing it in Strixhaven 2 mm -hmm. with their bloom. It hasn't been an effective strategy since, like, Corset 2012 yeah. with a Johnny's Pride mate. Right. So and I just, I, I am not convinced. Yeah, I, I'd be very curious to see if uh, Life Game is a, is an archetype that's viable mm -hmm. in this, in this set. I don't mm -hmm. think it is, um, but I was, I was more looking at being able to play additional lands on your turn. So if you do have like a land heavy uh, deck for whatever reason, um, I, I'm not as intimate with the 
uh, rares and mythics in the set here. So if there was something that could, you know, find new additional lands or anything like that, that would be great. Um, and then just having another creature, uh, a haste I don't care about, but uh, something that can just keep growing. Um, now you're going to run the risk of like that's going to be a targeted creature, so it's right. it's definitely um, a target for destruction. So right. there's there's risk with this one, but that's definitely a game ender if you can keep that that land alive. And you know if you got a eight eight whatever, and then you could throw a piece of equipment or something that keeps it from getting blocked. You can put some trample on it. You could do numerous things too, and that that would end the game very quickly. It gives you some late game action. It does. Sure. Yes. It yeah. I just wonder, like, it's these are weird to me because they consistently say on the show how mm-hmm. you in modern limited you always have something to do. Mm-hmm. And then I see these cards and it's like all this extra mana it wants you to to pump into it while you have all these cards in hand. I don't know. I guess this this is where I will stake my claim and plant my flag i think these classes are bad and i am ready to be proven wrong okay and get my ass beat by them (laughs) that's fair (laughs) now one more green card for me okay inspiring bard okay this is a four mana three three Yes, that's right. Another hill giant. And I learned my lesson and I gave it a D or an F. They gave it a C. <laughs> <laughs> he gave it a C minus. It does have an, an additional upside, of course. Uh, it has bardic inspiration. So you can give a creature plus two plus two when it comes into play. Or you can do the song of rest. You gain three life when it comes into play. The gain three life seems bad. Yeah, that's, that's, not, that, that's not very interesting to me. The plus two plus two, a temporary boost to your to one creature. That again, this seems like very definitional hill giant fallacy, where it's like four mana three three with minor upside. I felt very, very comfortable giving this a D or an F, and I was very upset when it got a fine grade. <laughs> I don't understand. I gave it the C minus. I thought I was being generous. You were with hedging. That, honestly. Yeah, I was. Um I was kind of trying to take the middle of the road. It paid mm-hmm. off for me. But, um, so the Bardic in- Inspiration where you give a target creature plus two plus two until end of turn. So you're going to play that in your first main phase. They're going to know what creature they're going to, you're going to send their way attacking so they can figure that out. You're not, it's right. not a gotcha card, it's not anything nope. like that. So that sucks. Game three life, I don't, woohoo. No, like, that doesn't matter. I'm, even with, even with a life game theme a four mana three three is not worth that i don't think i don't think so i and yes. with all of the life gain stuff it doesn't matter if you gain one life or three life. exactly so exactly. very very underwhelming yep totally agree yeah well speaking of underwhelming let's go to artifacts and lands and okay wrap up our review now i see you have a very strong comment for our first artifact. Absolutely. Well, tell me all about it. Okay. It's the bag of holding. I'll be holding all the gold whenever this uh, <laughs> people start uh, seeing how good this card is. Okay. So, it's uh, powerless mana. It's an uncommon. It's an artifact. Whenever you discard a card, exile that card from your graveyard. So, that's just mm-hmm. preface for what we're about to talk about here. So, pay two and tap this and draw a card, then discard a card. You can pay four, tap, and then sacrifice the backup hold, and return all cards exiled with backup hold to their owner's hand. So I give it an A-. minus. I think it's fantastic. I love this card. I think it's a great card draw. Um, just to kind of filter through, you can do a lot of tricky things with this one. Um, and you gave this a C+, plus, so you would play it. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, Limited Resources gave this a DNF. They would not even play this card. Which I think is absolutely ridiculous. This is the farthest apart that I've ever been with uh, with LR. So, right. um, this is either going to be, this this will be my defeat card or my victory card. That's, that's yeah. for sure. So, it's going to happen a little more. So, I'll be interested to see. Um, 
what this one does. So I, th I think it depends on how grindy this format is. Um, yeah. This is one of the only cards in the set that is a reprint, actually. Uh, this first appeared in a core set, I believe. And it was a rare at the time. Mm -hmm. And it didn't quite uh, hold its weight, pun intended. Oh. Um, yeah. But I don't know. Like It seems like in the last few sets, games have gone on and it's more of kind of a resource battle. Mm -hmm. And resource battle is in like people always have cards in their hand. So I don't know. I mean, yeah. this might be... I, I definitely thought it was better than a D or an F. Yeah. I, like, if you get this on turn... I don't know. Say you throw it down turn one, you're not going to play it on... You're not going to do that on turn two or anything. But yeah. if it's like turn three, turn four, you got a couple extra men, like you got some treasure tokens, draw a card, discard a card, you can, I don't know, discard a land if you're just land heavy, but if you've got some really good creatures or if you want some stuff that's like, this will be good later in the game, but I just can't play them right now, like I'm trying to get the lands... So you got like a nice dragon or something like that. Um, then sacrifice the bag of holding. There's in black. We didn't really talk about this, but there's a lot of um, discard. There's a lot of uh, mill. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to where your hand or and or library could be um, kind of ransacked, and this right. kind of saves you from that. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity here to use this one. I think this one. These might be big brain plays, or they could just fall apart very quickly. Uh, I don't sure. think there will be any in between on those. Yeah, um, and I think our grades are perfectly reflective on that. I'm yeah, I'm gambling. I'm saying this is a big brain card, so that's why I said A minus. Um, Limited resources says no. Nope, you're you're an idiot for playing this, so they give it the D or F. So uh, time will tell and see which camp is right. And I played it safe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep. You went safe on this one. C plus. I will say this: you were mentioning your turn one, turn two play. There are lots of games that I've played in recent limited where I'm not doing anything turn one, turn two. Yeah, sure. It kind of sounds good to play this turn one, and then mm -hmm. any time when I've got a couple extra mana, loot, and eventually I draw in a, a lot of extra cards. Mm -hmm. you know? Yep. I this is definitely this. better than the... Uh, there's a similar card in Strixhaven that cared about instants and sorceries, and it was far less efficient mm. than this is. Sure. So. Yeah, this doesn't care about that. And, I, and that's just something that's in general that I don't like, is whenever you have all these like qualifiers for a card. So like, there was a card in here. It's like, destroy target, non-angel, non-demon, right. non-zombie, non-whatever. It's like, oh my god. Like... <laughs> Come on. Like, stop. Do, do I need to consult my lawyer? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, well, I, yeah, this doesn't have that, so that is much better than something yeah. that says it's only instant sorcery or only enchants or whatever. Right. Well, I heard you like text, so let's talk about 50 feet of rope. Oh, okay. This is one generic mana for an artifact. You can... Climb over with it. Tap. Mm. Target wall can't block this turn. Tie up. Three tap. Target creature doesn't untap during their next untap step. Or repel down. Four tap. Venture into the dungeon only as a sorcery. Mm -hmm. This is my big delta. Okay. Uh, you gave it a DRF. So did they. I gave it a B plus. So very kind of similar disparities in these last few cards mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. us and LR. Just flipped. I... Obviously, making a wall unable to block sucks. Yeah, that's whatever. Four tap venture is super late game. I don't think that's super relevant. I really just gave this the grade for a one mana artifact that you can pay three and tap to freeze a creature with the tie up mm -hmm. portion. That seems pretty good to me. It's definitely not a two mana tapper. And God forbid it's not a one mana tapper. But the fact that it's not just tapping a creature, but it's it makes it so it doesn't untap. So I think it gives you a lot of control over the game. Yeah. Your opponent goes into you and you just freeze their creature for the next turn. And then if it does go super late, you do have something to do. I do think I was overzealous with the B plus. Okay. Okay. Because it's mana intensive. Three it mana is. is a lot of mana on top of your one mana artifact to make it so it doesn't untap. 
And then four mana to venture, like four mana tap scry two is not very good. I think these things come together and it's a playable. I don't think it's in the B category. It should okay. have been in C. Okay. But I think I also want to say, oh, sorry, did you have some? Well, so when I originally read this, I mm -hmm. just read it as tap target creature, mm -hmm. essentially. So that's why it I guess the beer end F. tapping. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of read this wrong, and kind of I kind of lucked out in this one where it did kind of go in my favor. But um, you know, if I were to redo this, I'd probably put it in the C category just based on that. So I I absolutely agree with you that the wall part I don't care about. That's definitely it, it's better. its own flavor I, and i guess that. that's just that's true. yeah yep, i get that and then the uh the repel down and venture into the dungeon again goes with flavor but um the card before that with it we weren't really about to get into though i'll talk about it anyways right yeah, now but that uh, dungeon map is three mana and you can tap it for a colorless I need, a like three this. and tap it yeah venture to the dungeon so this is more efficient here. So this yeah. not only adds mana, this is just one less mana to actually sink into it to venture to the dungeon. So I would rather have the dungeon mana than the rope if you're comparing those two. Now well, you're you're also a sucker for three mana mana rocks and limited that have some other upside. For sure, I did give that one a B minus. Uh, mm -hmm. You and uh, one of the resources gave that one a C minus. Totally disagree. I still think that's a B minus, but uh, that's that's one. So. We'll get back to the 50 feet of rope because that is a card discussion. But um, yeah, I actually now, once hearing you talk about how this actually locks down until uh, through the next untap step, uh, that does make this a stronger card. I'd probably go closer to C in this one. Uh, C, yeah. or C minus. Uh, C minus, I think, is where I would actually put yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Playable, but not super exciting. Right. I, I think it's. I think this will see play. I, don't, I think it'll be a fringe card. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, did you want to talk about Evolving Wilds? It's fine if you don't have any particular comments. I don't have anything really exciting to say about it, but they just the fact that they finally printed a fetch land in yeah. limited and now standard, essentially at that point, I think is very exciting. Uh, I gave this an A-, minus. I was probably a little too overzealous with this one as well. Uh, mm -hmm. You and uh, uh, LSV gave this a C+, plus, which I think that is that is more in line. Um, but, I mean, Evolve Wilds is great, that you can sacrifice and search, search for a basic land. This allows for unlocking all sorts of multicolored uh, right. cards. This smooths and out a lot of things. The fact is, you know, we're not in Strixhaven anymore. Strixhaven mm -hmm. had the campuses. Each color pair had a dual land in yes. common. Yes. That does not exist here. So yeah. I think this actually does go up a little bit in the rating because of that. Sure. Now, one thing that I actually noticed, we didn't know and talk about this either, is that I saw a lot of cards that had double colored mana. Lots of pips. Yeah. Yes. So. I think that's going to help as well, having like an Evolving Wilds here to be able to do that. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you get a bunch of cards, if you got like, I don't know, if you're, say you're red-blue, you have a card that's one blue-blue, and then you have a card that's two red-red, that's right. tough. That sucks. Right. So you, you need to make your mana bases you got to smooth it out. Mm -hmm. So I think Evolving Wilds is a good pick for something like this. Um, you know, dual lands obviously are, are nice too, and, Sure. Um, you really can't put those together, but they are in standard. But we are probably not limited, so that's it'll be interesting yeah. to see how standard shakes out now that the uh, Evolving Wilds is in here. So again, it's basic yeah. land, so we'll we'll still see. But um, I I think it's I think it's good that they introduced um, some fetch lands now at this point. So I think they're just trying to test the waters now. A bit by putting in yeah. Evolving Wilds, they're not going to put in. Like, you know, super super strong stuff at this point, but uh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think they're getting a toe in the water here with the, the Vulcan Wilds. One last note before we get to the final scores here. Sure. Um, did you notice how many D's and F's we gave? <laughs> Look at if you just scroll down through LR's grades. Yeah, oh, there's so many. It's pretty nuts. It, it really is. Um, you can you can definitely see like. So mine, I, I started with the white cards, or I'm sorry, I started with the 
well, white, but I started with the monocolored cards, mm. moved over to uh, multicolored cards, and then I finished with the uh, artifacts and the lands. So it's funny to see my slow descension into <laughs> <laughs> more and more D's and S. So, like, yeah. white just has, like, uh, it has two, blue has one, uh, two, excuse me, uh, black has one, red has two, green has four, <laughs> yeah. artifacts has four, it's just like, okay. Four out of like eight cards. Out of, out of eight yeah, half of them. And I was actually nicer about them than, uh, Much nicer. LC. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, just looking at the artifacts, because I did want to mention that, so... The artifacts, there are a total of how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. And seven of them got D's or F's. <laughs> I had the comment there. It's like, I, I'm really sick of artifacts being garbage. Me too. Um, I, I would love for either either make them colored, which is yeah. they were doing for a while. Yeah, I like the plus two mace. Right. So. Or, or just make them more narrow and better. Either yeah. way, yeah. I think it's it's silly to have things like you know. It's a good example we all agreed on here. The spare dagger, yeah. The spiked pit trap, the shitty six mana do five to a creature spell. Mm. Like, it's just pointless. It really is. So, do artifacts and equipment really have much of a place in the common and uncommon category? I mean, they don't take up many slots in general they don't, in, the, no. in, in the entire thing but i get why they don't want them to be overly strong mm -hmm. because you don't want colorless things that can go into every deck to be the most important things sure but that just puts artifacts in a weird place you know it really does like it's either well like to your point if you want to make them more narrow but good like you could put those in the rare slot and there, there are plenty of rare myths there are so they're good and yeah anybody would be happy to put those on there but like um, the commons, the uncommons that they do yeah. have and are just such a horrible representation. Or they're just like yeah. so lackluster. It's like, come on, just add one more card in each of the, you know, monocolors and just yeah. add another. Yeah, it's like I would rather see something like that. So I do I like know. your favorite artifact. You love that, like I said, the three mana, add a mana, do something else card. Yeah. I mean, that's a great artifact because. It's not amazing ramp. It's not so good that every deck wants it, but it is good in the ramp deck that's trying to get to seven, eight, nine mm -hmm. mana. Sure. And uh, it's interesting. And yeah. it, that, over the last several sets, that's been the only artifact card that is worth a damn. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one I usually grade well, but yeah, there's yeah, definitely some lackluster cards that yeah. just. Kind of seem like a waste of space. Well, with all that being said, are all you right. ready to reveal the winner? Filthy Casuals Review, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Seth, 306. Kenny, 268. Oh, man. Not as close this time. No, it was not. No. I, I definitely had, in my review... A fair number of cards where I got like sixes, sevens, and eights on my score, which is not good, just to remind the audience. Sure. <laughs> you don't want high scores in this game. No, lower the better. Yeah, there were the barbarian, cl the classes, the classes and the dragons. That was the biggest concern that I had. It's just a cycle in both colors that I just consistently did not grade very well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, sure. Whew. Yeah, I would say I actually missed more on the artifacts because it was all D's and F's. Right. And I, I'm sitting here with an A minus, so there's eight points right there. That's like backbreaking. <laughs> sure. And then uh, like Iron Golem, we don't have to go through the cards. I had a B minus versus D or F. And yeah, those those hurt. Yeah. Those hurt a lot. So you get too many of those, and you're just out of the game. I also had a weird thing where blue cards I did awful on. I, I did as well. I was actually just looking at that. Yeah. And uh, and then in black, suddenly I was hitting pretty well. Mm hmm And I, I missed pretty hard on there. Just That was actually one of the comments was that it's like, I thought that was actually a pretty strong color. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, the 
dings and were just flying left and right. Yeah, I when it came to black. So they, I, I just missed them. They were not shy about the D's and F's in this review. They let which them is, fly like crazy. Which is that a little bit different than what we've been seeing? Because there's been times where I'm like, "Wow, I can't believe that they gave it yeah. here." Yeah, and, and like here, I just felt like there's like so many of them. Like, oh. Yeah, this it's, is just like it's, ridiculous. It's pretty crazy. I don't know what to make of it. We've done four reviews so far. Mm-hmm. We did Call Time and Strixhaven, which were the two most recent expert level sets, which I would say very few Ds and Fs. You know, mm-hmm. Modern mm-hmm. Magic doesn't print a lot of unplayable cards sure. or Ds and Fs in to Limited. And then we did our flashback review of... Mm, yeah. Fate Reforge, and that was a shit show. That was, yeah, it was like half the cards were unplayable. And this one is pretty close to that as far as the number of D's and F's, which I think is them just adjusting to this new world we live in. Because if, so if you look at most of the D's and F's, it's not that they're unplayable. It's not that they're yeah. so bad that they literally don't do anything. I think mm-hmm. it's just Luis and Marshall realizing and adjusting to the fact that you can do better than a lot of these cards. And yeah. even though this card is fine and you won't be embarrassed to play it, you should still try to avoid playing it because it's bringing down your win percentage. Hmm. Now, um, just not having listened to their podcast yet, mm-hmm. uh, did they enjoy the set overall? That's interesting. I think that that's going to have to like be a wait and see. Um, yeah, I'm interested because they have... I, because of all these T's and F's, you yeah. think that they don't really like this one as well. The thing is that, that they liked uh, Fate Reforged, even though they graded most of the cards as T's and F's. They liked <laughs> right. that. Right. Yeah, would, so it's interesting. I would definitely recommend uh, everybody listening, go watch LSV's first draft on Channel Fireball because he actually addresses this question. People are saying, what do you think of the set so far? And he's basically saying it. it's hard to say. Like, yeah. He's like, even the sets that I've hated the most, I enjoyed the first few drafts because it's a new okay. format. You're trying to learn what's going on. It's just it's just fun to do. Mm-hmm. So that's I, fair. I, I think time will tell. It what what matters more is here in the next couple of weeks they will have their show on limited resources talking about their first findings, their initial findings with the set, mm-hmm. and then you'll get a better feel for what they think. Okay, yeah, I look forward to hearing about that one. Well. Thank you very much for joining me today, Seth. Absolutely. My pleasure. It's always a treat. We are Red Mage Blue Mage. You can find us on Twitter at Red Blue MTG. You can find me on Twitter at Wolfmere. You can find me at Carter SA on any social media. Bye. Bye.